uh, their founders, uh, Mark and, and Ovi. Um, I would like to welcome you guys to Whirlpool. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks very much, guys. Thanks, guys. Okay, so uh, give us like a, your standard introduction to what CoinFlow is and what they're about, and then we'll dig into some specifics. Sure. So CoinFloor is the leading UK Bitcoin exchange. We're the primary place for people to trade GBP BTC. Um, uh, we lead the volume and uh, in terms of liquidity and spreads, we're the, the main place to go. Um, and just as a background, we started three years ago. User joined your channel. We, at the time, we were obviously the last place for a very with low single digit market share. Now we regularly have market share in the UK GBP currency pair of 40% plus um, and by pretty much all metrics we're the top exchange in the UK. Okay and um, so wh where are you guys based in terms of the company and uh, what's your, the banking situation since you guys are spot exchange the fiat uh, flow is really important. Sure so uh... We're, our offices are in London. Um, we're here uh, near Chancery Lane Station. Um, our banking is in Europe, and uh, in terms of jurisdiction, we're also we're based here in the UK, UK company. And have you pursued any of these kinds of regulations that, for example, Bitstamp or the FCA? I think there's a, a license. Have you done any kind of that stuff? Um, short answer: Yes. Longer answer. Um, we spend a large percentage of our time in conversations with people like the FCA, etc., um, on looking at regulation in the UK. Okay, and how are you guys uh, funded? Um, we've received funding from um, mainly Passion Capital, who um, are a very well-regarded UK-based VC. Um, also, our chairman, who is, his name's Adam Knight, he was the ex-manager director User for Global channel. Commodities at Goldman Sachs and Credit Suisse, and a number of other um, investors. Okay, so you guys aren't going out of business uh, by the end of the year because you're running out of money or anything like that? No, no, we're, uh, we're operating at a sustainable pace right now. That's good because a lot of uh, the customers need to trust uh, when they're depositing funds that uh, everything's okay. Uh, um, so, how, how speaking of security, then, so what, what, how exactly are you securing when people are depositing their Bitcoin with you? Okay, um, it's a very good question. I think the the main we we obviously perform all of the things that you would expect from a Bitcoin exchange, but. Our key, um, the key two initiatives, which we still think we are um, unique, at least in the West, and probably for most um, main exchanges. One is that we have 100% cold storage of a policy for our Bitcoin. So that means we store all Bitcoin offline um, and we secure the, all the keys that secure our Bitcoin in um, vaults stored at very high levels of security in multiple votes um, that because we have a hundred percent cold storage policy we've had to build a number of processes in place in the back end um, operationally to be able channel. to still allow people to withdraw um, bitcoin relatively quickly but to be fair we're not as easy to withdraw from or as, uh, as uh, other exchanges that don't um, follow a 100 percent cold storage policy but we we make an assumption that um, we want to be able to protect our customers' Bitcoin, even in the worst case. Um, the other thing in terms of trust and the security of the individuals behind the company, we are public individuals. We allow people with by appointment to come and visit us and talk to us if they have, if they wish to. Um, and as I said, our investors are people like Adam Knight, who has a background in the, the UK financial space and Passion Capital, who's um, one of their major investors is the UK government that help, helps, helps the credentials. And finally, we have a policy we call um, um, provable solvency. So we do a hundred, we do a, we are from the beginning, we did regular monthly audits um, of our Bitcoin holdings and released them publicly. We've done that from the beginning 
and we've done that uninterrupted since we've started. And I don't think there is uh, um, any other exchange that has that track record of doing from the beginning and reporting it consistently. So who has those keys? Which of you guys are, like, is it a multi uh, coach star situation where both of you have to have a key? Do you have other guys that are trusted with keys? <laughs> who exactly okay. is in charge? <laughs> All right. Um, we, Great question. So, it, first of all, we, 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 it is multi-sig, um, and um, we have a, um, a proprietary um, solution that's still using multi-sig for, for that. But in terms of who has the keys, we can't, we can't tell you who has the keys for has security any, reasons. Has any exchange answered that question? <laughs> Well, we it's well the, the, okay to ask it differently. Then, I, I mean, because in order for people to trust that the funds are safe, they want to know that. Like, I mean, is it is it only people that are top level? Are you contracting out security? I mean, we need to have some kind of detail about who's the ones trusted with the keys. Is it in house uh, contracted, etc.? It's not okay, no, okay. I um, understand your question. We're not using services, um, absolutely not using services like BitGo, if that's what you mean. Yes. We're not contracting out this to any third parties. It is um, um, people who have a vested interest in the company yeah. um, um, and have a stake in the company are, have, are the people who are securing the keys. And it's only and, people and who are... Or who are, or are employed, who have a business interest in the company, who have access okay, to okay. So, so another reason why is because you have to; they have to be sufficiently incentivized, right? So you look at the case like Shapeshift. Um, you know, as, uh, they basically got on some sysadmin that they didn't do a proper background check on. He had access to stuff, planted, uh, you know, uh, exploits everywhere, and screwed them over that way. And so the 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 questions more also getting at you know how. Uh, is the technical expertise from the top down in your company to be able to be actually directly in charge of that kind of stuff? So, I mean, my background was over 15 years as a CTO before coming in here. So I have a, I believe I have a technical background. Um, and we, the processes for management of, of keys are heavily documented and are have been practiced now over three years. So we, um, we, and we continually monitor those processes. So I, I think we are comfortable with the process of managing the keys. We've also made those processes very, very simple. So they're, they're pretty much foolproof. In terms of um, who has access to the keys, um, as I said, it's not people like um, sysadmins, et cetera. User left your channel. Um, and yeah, I'm, I, oh, and the other thing is all, all key employees within the company go through criminal reference checks, et cetera. So we do do background checks on people. And how, how many employees uh, are there? So currently we're 10 people. We're about to grow to 12 people in the next few weeks. Okay. So uh, now let's get into the products then. So uh, are you guys doing only uh, spot? Or are you offering any margin products where people can trade on leverage? It's currently only spot. Okay, and and oh, and by the way, are you are you like locking off to U.S. Uh, traders or any? Do you have any kind of restrictions on that? Uh, we're currently locking off to. That's correct. We're currently locking off. Uh, so no U.S. traders. Uh, currently, the residencies we offer are basically anyone in most parts of the EU um, and and the UK, of course. Okay, so you're specifically only accepting Europeans and Britons. That's the residency. So we have we're slightly more permissive in terms, or we're more permissive in terms of nationalities. But this is where you're resident. Okay, okay, that's a good distinction. Um, so, uh, so you don't offer margin products. Are you offering any like over the counter trading? Or are you only uh, doing uh, the order book, the public order book exchange trading stuff? Yep, we do. Uh, we do a number of OTC trades as well. We regularly are doing OTC trades also. And would you say that's most of your business now, or is it? How's the balance between the operations in terms of what's actually generating the money? Um, it's, we don't, we don't typically comment on the, the volumes, but 
nowadays more more of the volumes are on the exchange rather than OTC. Obviously, we have an incentive to get more of the volumes to be on the exchange uh, rather than OTC because it, it shows publicly and it's better for all the participants on the exchange. But but yeah, we typically don't comment too much on the OTC volume. Okay, so um, and in terms of the spot products, how many different pairs are you trading? How many different order books are there? Sure. So there's a pound Bitcoin, euro Bitcoin, dollar Bitcoin, and uh, Polish Lottie Bitcoin. You got a lot of Polish traders? Uh, no. Uh, it was mostly in addition due to uh, kind of banking relationships we had, and and uh, and we we did have we do have some some corporate uh, Polish Polish Lottie users. And um, and tell us about uh, the um, the fee structure that you guys have because uh, now not too long ago you were you were now introducing this policy of zero percent trading fees. So how exactly does that work and how are you making the money in that situation? Sure. So we're we're making the money on deposits and withdrawals of uh, fiat currency. So we have a number of users who are regularly depositing or or withdrawing. Um, ranging from investors, corporates, um, you know, various types of users. So we we make a healthy amount of revenue from those fees. And what we're looking to actively grow is the the user base of active traders, um, retail traders, professional traders, and just people who are doing two way trading. And so that and and that's why we we launched zero fee trading because we felt that it would it would incentivize liquidity it would uh tighten spreads and it would incentivize more more trading now at the same time we launched that we um well about a week later to just to give a transitionary period we introduced um percentage fees on deposits and withdrawals and we set them of fiat. At, of, of fiat only of fiat deposits and withdrawals of fiat and we set those at a level where they were still sustainable for us given our existing um, um, setup in terms of the type of customers who, do, who use our platform. So say I want to go sign up a coin floor and I want to drop a uh, hundred thousand US dollars on there. What's it going to cost me in terms of the fee for depositing it? It'll, uh, so you can see the range on our fees table, but it ranges from uh, 0.34% to 0.38%. So you'll pay somewhere in the range of 36 basis points or so. I think it's about about 350, 360 pounds. And so you know, when you compare when you compare that to if I were to deposit it on uh, Bitfinex, you know, that would cost me just like you know 15, 20 bucks. So that's a for, for traders of a certain size, it starts to get it starts to hurt a bit there on a percentage basis. Sure. I mean it'll be a more expensive deposit, but that being said. The trades would be free, so the the actual trading in and out would be much cheaper than if, if you're making a couple of trades, um, you're already ahead of where you'd be on on Bitfinex. Yeah, that's a that's a fair point, and I'm not sure how it nets out. Uh, and maybe someone of that size should just be doing OTC to begin with. <laughs> but um, okay, so the, so that's the other interesting thing is that you guys actually. Um, in order to incentivize liquidity, obviously you have the zero percent, but you also have this uh, no uh, no pence, right? You are uh, when you're pricing the BTC USD at least. I'm not sure how it is for the other pairs, but you are doing. Uh, oh, sorry, not BTC USD, but BTC uh, GBP, the British pound pair. You have one pound ticks. Uh, is that only for that pair? Is it also for others? And uh, can you explain to traders? Who might be confused like why you do this and how it exactly it produces uh, better liquidity sure so yeah to answer your question it's for all pairs uh so dollars uh euros lotty um pounds all have a one one unit tick size and the reason for this is basically if you're um if you're looking to place a large trade or any size trade um and let's say you place an order at 815 pounds uh, you place your bid there, and someone can easily come and and out outbid you by one pence uh, or or ten pence or or two pence or some small amount, and this is a very low risk way of of undercutting someone's order 
Whereas what you're doing is taking real, real risk with, with a large size trade. And so what it does is it basically incentivizes people to show their full order. It's, it incentivizes liquidity and because you know that in order for someone to actually outcompete your bid, they have to undercut, undercut you or outprice you by a whole pound. And so it incentivizes more people to put up passive limit orders and to, to make trades. It also makes, makes large trades much easier because you're going to match with fewer orders. There are, there are two other interesting um, side effects of this as well, which is that one, um, for, the, uh, um, for the person viewing the book, it's easier to get an idea of how much it will cost you or how to buy some Bitcoin or how much you would get for if you sold some Bitcoin, because it, it's, it's easier just to calculate the numbers just by looking at the, the different tick sizes, as opposed to multiple orders spread over at different penny um, tick points. Um, and the other benefit as well, which is one of the reasons why we introduced it first before zero fees, is that it makes, if you think about it, it makes wash trades um, technically nearly very, very difficult, if not impossible to do, because we're pooling up liquidity at one point. And if you, there are already orders at a certain price point, you, um, they get fulfilled first in, first out. So it's harder for people to, um, and it's very often that one tick below is the, is the buy price, the, the match price to buy at. So it's much harder for someone to to trade with themselves. Yeah, because that's the problem a lot of people had uh, with the Chinese when before they did the recent uh, change in the um, uh, in their fees, they had zero percent, and there was a lot of botting and a lot of uh, washing, and maybe even worse than that, depending who you ask. Uh, and now that's actually the standard model of the Japanese exchanges. They're really the only other ones that are doing zero percent trading fees. Um, and so, and they're dominating volume uh, right now, actually, uh, compared to the uh, Chinese and the Western exchanges. So, so how you, and the tick that the one pound ticks and the one unit ticks that that helps to prevent the washing. But um, I mean, are you are you worried that maybe there's uh, or do you have any other kind of safeguards to prevent any shenanigans like we've seen in China? Ultimately. The, the, I mean, the nice thing about a one pound tick size, as Obi said, is it's, it's, it's a very effective policing measure in order to do a wash trade when, with a one pound tick size, if you had two accounts and trying to trade between the two, you would be, you would be taking significant risk that someone else would match against your orders. And with a, you know, you can do that on a very small tick, uh, exchange, but on an exchange where you have a, a decent tick, it's just very difficult to do so and let's take the other side even if people ostensibly are, are offering fees for trading who's to say that they haven't made an arrangement with some of their larger or more preferred clients to still be on zero fees etc and they would still then be in a position to potentially perform a level of wash trading with the tick size it's public and open and so that's not possible and how much volume are you guys doing across all the pairs? We're doing about uh, 600 to 800 coins a day. And most of that's on the pound uh, pair. Correct. Correct. And so do you have any, I mean, and I looked at, I was, I've been uh, looking through the platform and I think it's, it's fine and everything, but the, the problem mostly is just that it's, it's a simple spot exchange. So people are able to exchange their fiat deposits in your system for Bitcoin. And that's about it. Uh, there's no margin products. Uh, so and that's really what traders, especially retail traders are demanding. Um, are there any plans to introduce margin uh, the way sort of uh, Bitfinex or Kraken does it? Um, or any kind of derivatives products that uh, have any leverage uh, in them? So, um, margin amongst other things are, are products that we, of course, are investigating and continue to investigate. Um, however, we have a policy of not confirming, um, anything that we work on until it's basically ready to go live. Um, however, um, that is something that, you know, we would be very interested in hearing the viewpoint of, 
of you guys in terms of how to how would be best to implement that um, in order for us to achieve some of our um, medium to long term gains. And just to tell you, give an idea of those, we we believe we know that the UK FX trading uh, market is represents over 30 percent of worldwide FX trading volumes. And we believe that we could we could get to that level within 24 months from now. And that's what we're targeting. Um, just to, to give you a background, we've been growing solidly over the last two years. And um, in the last um, six months or so, we've been growing at a rate of over 20% month on month. Well, but it'll be impossible for you to get there without having margin. So uh, basically you need to do either like a peer-to-peer -peer lending system the way Phoenix does, or you arrange some kind of financing the way Kraken does and just to provide it that way. But that's that's how you dominate volume. And Phoenix, even after getting hacked, now dominates <laughs> BTCUSD volume. And that's a testament to how important margin trading is. So however it's implemented, letting people trade at least with uh, you know three, five times leverage, is, uh, is that's how you're going to get there. But then... But that then create some regulatory issues, basically. Sure, agreed. I think that would definitely be something we would need to do. Um, what what advice would you guys have um, on implementing that and the challenges involved and margin in general? Well, and, well, and oh, by the way, and afterwards I can talk a little bit about the regulatory challenges. Okay, well, I mean, I, I can tell you just from uh, the community in general that the peer to peer lending would be the best way to do it. So basically allowing people to deposit their fiat and lend to the, the margin traders who want to do the uh, trading. Uh, that would be the ideal way to do it. Uh, Kraken does it like the second best way where they just provide the juice to whoever uh, wants to lend money or borrow money rather to trade on margin. But yeah, just give people the opportunity to trade on leverage. That's what traders want and need. Not just the uh, retail traders and small traders, but large traders just prefer uh, being able to trade on margin and uh, being able to limit their counterparty risk. So the two implementations I would recommend that most people here are using in terms of, uh, since you guys don't want to do the derivatives uh, products necessarily, maybe you do, but uh, if you're going to stick to spots, then you should look at Bitfinex as one model and Kraken as a separate model. Out of the two, um, you, you prefer in terms of the way um, money is provided to the margin traders, Bitfinex's model, but in general, out of the two, which do you prefer or what do you like or putting it in a more yeah, diplomatic way, what do you like yeah. from each two two's models? Well, I, I, in terms of the model that Bitfinex uses, it's nice for, for being on the other side where you want to uh, have, maybe you have a bunch of Bitcoin that you want to lend out and uh, earn interest on. Um, or you have some fiat and you want to earn like a nice little extra return on. I mean, sometimes, uh, for example, on Bitfinex, you can earn like, you know, 10 to 20 percent APY lending out fiat. And that's, uh, you know, you allow people to a market to form in the lending of funds for the purpose of margin trading. Um, so, I mean, I, I that, that's, that has its pros and cons. I mean, it's, it's nice and stable on Kraken to consistently have a financing source that isn't uh, so variable in the interest, because when you have a market determined lending rate, it's going to swing around and be variable. And with Kraken, they tell you it's a fixed rate and that's what you're going to get. So there's some certain pros and cons to it. Uh, but uh, I think most people prefer the peer-to-peer -peer lending model for the margin trading. And uh, yeah, just offer like you know, uh, either 30% initial margin or, you know, 20% initial margins doable at Bitcoin's volatility. And that's what uh, that's what people, that's what traders need, really, because bits, look at Bitstamp as an example. They've been around forever, but their volume is basically, the, it has a ceiling on it because they're not offering uh, margin. And so that's, it, hurt, it harms liquidity and the volume just doesn't necessarily get to the point that it uh, needs to get. So that's those. That's really the way to do it. Okay. Yeah. Th that's that's really helpful feedback. Um, yeah. I mean, are there any deeper than just the the concept of margin? Are there any pitfalls you would have us avoid in terms of the implementation, in terms of uh, liquidations or anything like that? I mean, what what what's What's a, what's a critique you have of some of the existing platforms? 
Um, well, just all you have to do is be really transparent and clear about how the risk management works, like how the maintenance margin level is set and how the liquidation and margin call procedures, how exactly they happen and at what threshold. Um, and I guess just the, I, I mean, if you're going to implement a proper margin system, then the exchange has to backstop it, which means no social losses, none of that stuff. Uh, um, if you if the system takes a loss, then this exchange should eat it so that the traders are not affected. So in a in the Bitfinex system with um, peer to peer lending, if if there is a loss, the lenders don't lose out. Correct. Um, Phil um, from Phoenix, who is uh, often uh, here, has spoken exactly on that topic, where he says that Phoenix has, uh, in times of extreme volatility, has had to. Um, cover that and I mean basically you charge like a little bit of a higher fee on that activity in order to create like a little fund on the side that helps to address situations like that which are like you know uh, six sigma type events which will hit every now and then but you know you'll earn enough in the meanwhile to cover it um, so yeah Phoenix actually does cover uh, also uh, you know as uh, lenders never take a hit except for the 35% haircut in the hack, that's a hit, but uh, not in terms of the liquidations not getting filled. Yeah, no, that, that definitely makes sense. I, I, I just wasn't 100% sure that others did that, so it's good to know. Yeah, and I mean, and most of the margin volume is actually in the derivatives uh, space, so mostly futures contracts, because and it's pure Bitcoin, it's less about the documentation, verification stuff, and so people are able to throw a Bitcoin on there, and gear it up to like 20, 50 times leverage. Um, and so that's a different story where you have now a counterparty zero sum game uh, uh, product where if the system takes a loss, then you can then distribute that loss across the profitable traders of the given period. And that's how OKCoin does their risk management. And you could also do uh, an auto deleveraging kind of uh, termination procedure, which is what crypto facilities, also a UK uh, based exchange actually. And, um, and BitMEX has a similar system like that, uh, which is a hybrid actually with the social loss system. So that's, but those are different risk management systems that are more non spot margin. They're only for futures, which would still, which would actually be another option if you were just to. Uh, you know, spin off a separate uh, unit that was only doing futures product or something like that. Yeah, really helpful feedback. Um, we've we've definitely thought about uh, derivatives as well. Um, where where are you guys seeing most of the the volume in terms of the distribution between crypto facilities, Bitmax, OKCoin, on the on the future side? And well, yeah. Yeah, OKCoin dominates. Uh, they're number one by far. Uh, BitMEX takes a second, really far back second, and then crypto facilities is third. And then you get like, uh, you know, smaller upstarts like Derrybit and, and CoinPit, uh, which are doing less volume and they're really just getting going. But it's a growing uh, space. And there's, uh, and even Finex, BitFinex has started to talk about doing deliverable options. And a Deribit exchange actually offers uh, vanilla options. So the whole derivative space in general is really growing as risk management needs are increasing. Um, so, and they're, they're doing ridiculous kinds of volume there too on OKCoin futures. But so um, back back to the the questions then. So uh, what? So you, you're not you're only offering spot um, and. You have one uh, unit uh, ticks. You've got zero percent fees. Um, so how's the how's the frictions on the fiat? Like if I want to deposit the ten thousand dollars, like how how soon can I expect that I'll be able to get going on the exchange? What in terms of the setup time? Yeah, well, because in spot the big if people want to be profitable, part of it's about arbitrage, for example. So uh, the frictions of fiat going in and fiat coming out. Uh, this is kind of important for people that want to make plays based on the price uh, dislocations of other exchanges versus yours. Ah, sure. So in terms of moving pounds in, because uh, we don't have as much data on people moving dollars in and the timeframes for that, but in terms of moving pounds in, uh, pounds typically hit the exchange 
from the UK within one hour to same day. Now, obviously, depending, it depends on the bank. And, you know, if it's a really slow bank in the UK, it could be several days. But um, pounds will typically hit the bank, uh, hit our accounts uh, and get credited the same day. Um, dollars uh, internationally can be next day. Um, but that's, you know, that's, we have, you know, f we have less, less volume in dollars, obviously. So there's, there's less data there. Euros as well are, are typically going to be same day or next day, depending on uh, the SEPA configuration of the, of the, the user's bank. So you have different banks that are servicing the different deposits, or you have a single banking partner that can do everything. It's a it's a single banking partner. Um, we have we have a number of um, banks, but primarily we're using a single banking partner right now. And are you willing to say who who they are exactly? Uh, our current bank is uh, Cheska Sportelna in the Czech Republic. Okay. Okay. Uh, so it's not a it's not a British bank. In fact, it's uh, but they're still able to do this British uh, domestic bank transfer that takes an hour. Or how does that work? Yes. So and and they are um, all all of the banks we have are capable of handling um, more than one currency, um, and we we switch between banks on a periodic basis just to make sure we maintain a certain level of usage with each bank because if you don't if you don't use the account you start to lose the account but uh but yeah so we have multiple banks and at the moment um it's the czech bank that we use as our primary deposit point but would the would the would your average would your customer not um then have experienced different kinds of service depending on which bank you're using at a given time so what we make sure when when looking at banking partners is that they have very good clearing and correspondent banking relationships with UK banks, and that's how we're able to typically maintain very very fast deposit times. But obviously, it's not guaranteed. It's not like we can guarantee a certain speed. It, it depends on the banking network, and that that's uh, that's partially out of our control. Also, we um, are always looking at other banking relationships. Obviously, um, a big part of what we do is spend time looking at um, banking relations in Europe and the UK. Um, and although we're happy with our existing partners, we're looking for we keep looking for others that have faster speeds for um, for settlement of, of transfers in and out. Yeah, I mean, reliable banking is really central to a successful spot only exchange. Um, it's different when it's bitcoin in and out kind of thing because the bitcoin network is what it is but uh when once you're introducing fiat then it becomes a whole game with okay are the bankers gonna are they gonna play ball are they gonna be causing problems if the volume gets a bit high and this and that so it's that's why traders really need to know like okay this is a rock solid i mean if you for example and to bring it back not, not that i'm trying to shield for bitfinex but uh, they have a pretty reliable taiwanese connection that seems to be you know unstoppable no matter what's happening to them in terms of uh, getting hacked and being insolvent and all that stuff so that's the kind of reliability that traders really need when it comes to wiring money in an other place 100 percent. so um so you guys uh you guys are only doing bitcoin pairs uh, are there any and and i guess you said you didn't want to confirm or anything like that but maybe in terms of your philosophy in general on crypto um, are you planning to offer any uh, other cryptocurrency pairs um, like, you know, uh, I don't know, Litecoin, Monero, that kind of Z Zcash? Uh, this, uh, are there any uh, plans or philosophical desires in general for these uh, cryptocurrencies? So, um, yeah, I'm ha we're happy to answer that. And also, maybe at the end, give you a bit of our own personal philosophy on these things. So, um, we uh on we wouldn't consider ourselves bitcoin maximalists maximalists but we take the view that um we want to focus on the pairs that or the pair that has the highest volume is the most likely to be used as the de facto currency and at this point we think it's bitcoin and we do not see any other competitors who um are close to achieving that crown so 
we as a company have been focused on Bitcoin. We are not. Um, we've investigated and we have been asked about other currency pairs, but um, we are. We believe that our USPs are around being the bridge between um, the fiat world and the Bitcoin world. And that's where a lot of the value add we provide is dealing with the regulations, security, um, liquidity and, and compliance, etc. cetera, and, pro and operational processes around that being that bridge. Um, ultimately, converting from one um, crypto to another, we think will eventually be probably completely automated by someone at some point and won't User actually probably even team require team. an exchange. So we don't want to build up skill set in something that's going to be made obsolete. So I'm 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 kind of getting a hint there that you there's not a plan really to expand beyond uh, Bitcoin. Well, no. Um, so I, I mean, we'd never say never, but it's uh, it's very low on the list of priorities. Um, and when we resisted. Um, um, request um, to do that in the past, although we have investigated it um, carefully. Um, we would move to a new cryptocurrency, for example, if we believe that cryptocurrency would replace Bitcoin as the primary um, Bitcoin currency, uh, primary cryptocurrency. At this point in time, we don't see um, any currencies that have um, just looking at the volumes of trade and interest, et cetera, that have that opportunity. And we think that's mainly for technical reasons. If you ask me for a personal opinion, um, we, I mean, I like Monero, um, but we need to see something that's a, not just a 10% better Bitcoin than Bitcoin. It needs to be 10 times, a hundred times better. The only things we see on the horizon, maybe, especially with the latest announcements are some sort of mimble wimble mixed with value shuffle slash tumble bit um coin and that's probably three years away from being released and three or four or five years away from getting to a critical mass where it would overtake bitcoin but um if something else happened if ethereum all of a sudden took over um or monero took over not sure zero cash would take over um um, then we would we would replace to the primary cryptocurrency. Okay, and you brought up uh, uh, what CoinFloor's uh, USP is its unique uh, uh, selling uh, proposition. So, what in, in an environment where you've got say Bitstamp, 8-bit, Coinbase, Kraken? Uh, I mean, I could go on and on. Gemini. These are all. Uh, exchanges that are heading for the regulated spot only non and some of them even have a couple of them even have margin you know and so how what what exactly are you offering that's uh, truly unique and distinct in this sea of you know uh, spot exchanges that require verification and documentation to even trade on so really what it boils down to is any exchange is really competing um, highly on liquidity and for GBP BTC we have simply the best liquidity um, out of any exchange in the world so that's that's really our our USP on the liquidity side it's it's the easiest uh, place to convert between pounds and and Bitcoin and at the end of the day it's a network effect liquidity begets liquidity so over time we expect this actually this advantage to actually increase yeah and we 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 although we are already ahead um, in that respect, we decided to go to zero trade fees to aggressively ma uh, make sure we continue to um, increase the daylight between ourselves and competitors. And you are probably able to guess some of the things that we're looking at offering, um, but we'll be looking to offer services over the coming a few months or so, which will increase liquidity um, in that currency pair even further. The other thing is, as I said, we were um, we have a 100% cold storage policy, um, and we believe that um, we believe that all exchanges should move to that policy, um, but not all do. Um, obviously, it, it leads to a number of challenges, and operationally, internally, you have to structure yourself very differently than an organisation who has a 90x% cold storage policy 
For example, deposits go directly into co um, cold storage for us. Others, it, they go, they go into, uh, they can often go into a, um, hot um, or warm storage and then get sweeped into cold at some period of time. Um, so if your deposits are going into cold, you have to build as a business, a completely different structure. And we think ultimately time will show that if you haven't got a hundred percent cold storage, um, it, it could come back to bite you. Um, and the other thing we've had is an unbroken track record of monthly provable solvency orders since, moved since we launched, um, giving people clarity on the fact that we're maintaining reserves of our Bitcoin holdings. Again, someone can start doing that tomorrow, but they weren't doing it from the beginning. A new entry. Uh, how do you provide, um, sorry to interrupt, but can you provide details of how exactly you are doing this audit? So we, um, well, we explain to people how to confirm the audits in our monthly reports, and we give a high level overview there. Um, but high level, what we do is we transfer our, we, we perform a Bitcoin blockchain transaction for the full amount of, of um, Bitcoin we have in cold storage. Um, and that goes from one cold storage address to another. That does require us to go through, do a, through our own internal security processes, multi-signature um, transactions have to be created, etc. We then compare the balance, it, the, the amount that we have. So we actually do the solvency check effectively, um, where we compare the amount that we have in Bitcoin against the amount that we have, um, that we're supposed to have on, um, in terms of the records for all of our customers. And we should have more Bitcoin than we have for customers, which we have always had, and we always maintain to have. Um, and channel, we yeah. include in the transaction, a, um, an op return transaction with a hash of a record because showing a randomized list of the different balances for different addresses each line of that each line of that um hash and we we provide a link to that hash as well um to that um, the actual file each line of that hash can be decrypted only by the um user who owns that balance so every user can um confirm that the money that they believe they have with us is in that file and they can also add up all the totals and confirm that the totals of all that of that file are less than the amount that we we moved on the um, on the blockchain. Um, and given that any user can verify it, and we don't know which user is going to verify it, the 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 assumption is that you must make you must make all balances be available because you don't know who's going to check. And therefore, this is the best you can get to um, performing a provable solvency audit. This was um, suggested several years ago um, as an approach, and we follow that approach. There, there are obviously with every system, there are edge cases or ways it could be um, where, um, or which gamed. are quite, where it could be gamed and, they're, they're, and uh, they're quite challenging to perform. We're not doing that, but we're, we're doing the best that we possibly can without um, while balancing the needs to maintain people's privacy as well. So I, I think that that just sounds good. I like that kind of uh, effort uh, to demonstrate that you actually uh, have the reserves that are uh, back in the custom funds. Who, who wrote that implementation? Was it you guys? Um, so yes, we, we, we built it in-house, uh, 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 but the actual process was actually a published um yeah. article okay. on how to perform proof of reserves a good few years ago before we we launched and we were following that process and you've documented exactly how it works you have like your own kind of little white paper that explains how you implemented yeah we don't have our own white paper it's but we every time we do a release we explain what we do and because you have to explain what you do to to the customers in a very simple format so they can follow the steps to reverse it and um, and um, check their own balance. That's the, that's an interesting approach. Uh, so you and you're getting a little bit into your uh, the uh, philosophy. So um, there's a lot of people talking about the uh, hard forks and big blocks. So where exactly are you guys seeing when it comes to segwit 
uh, and whether or not uh, you know what the, what the way to scale Bitcoin is. Okay, so oh, um, we were one of the first um, to um, um, sign up to uh, the Bitcoin Core Initiative on SegWit, um, and we um, were also we don't really make too many um, Reddit posts, but very early on in the debate, we I think we we're one of the first to call out the fact that we thought this was this debate wasn't actually about the block size it was about governance it's one of our very few blog po um, reddit posts um in general we're just quiet and just getting on with um servicing our customers and growing liquidity on a increasing basis month by month um so that's our high level view um we um we believe this is a decision on on we, we believe in a view of people process product so you get the the best people they help you build the right product process to achieve the best product end result. Um, and this is not to say that other teams don't have great people, but we know the people of Bitcoin core have delivered historically and they've had a track record of delivery. So we are comfortable with the approach that they recommend at this stage, at this point in time. And, and we have not seen anything to, from our point of view to make us uncomfortable with their approach. So we we are definitely of the view that we should go with SegWit at this stage and give it a go, roll it out. If for some reason um, Bitcoin Unlimited succeeds over SegWit, um, this um, and takes over the network, we would have to support it because at the end of the day we service our customers. But our, our hope is for um, SegWit to be launched and. SegWit does increase um, the effective amount of transactions that can be kept, um, that can be stored in a block. So it achieves the aim of a hard fork in the short term. And then services like Lightning Network, et cetera, will increase that further off chain. Um, and also there are discussions and um, um, by, by various um, developers now for mechanisms for doing a hard fork or discussing a hard fork at the appropriate time when it's ready. We also don't think that it's needed right now, um, even a block size increase. I'm not sure if that's clear enough on our view. Yeah, no, I think that's, uh, I mean, that's kind of in line with a lot of, uh, I think a lot of people here think. Um, so before I, before I open up the, the, to everyone else that might have some questions for anything I might have missed or wasn't clear. Um, so have you, have you guys ever uh, at all experienced a, a hack, like a security breach where you've got coins taken or anything like that? No. That's good. That's good. All right, one second, I need to change the permissions. So one sec. Okay, now I've uh, opened up the talk power to the rest of the uh, community, the rest of the people here in this group. Uh, you are um, free to now ask the guys from CoinFloor, the UK uh, spot exchange, the top uh, BTC, uh, British pound liquidity. Uh, feel free to ask any questions, one at a time though. May I ask something? Yes, go ahead. What was the biggest struggle you had to overcome so far? Ooh, that's a great question. I know. Take a pick. We could take a pick. Um, I think there was there were a lot of struggles um, internally. They're just just being as a team. We have to learn to to really understand each other and really become efficient as a team. And I think we now we work together on all decisions um we we're very collective on on the way we approach um so and we, we we're pretty happy with where we've got to now but that as, as any young company was was a, was a struggle at the early days um another area i would say and mark could chime in um would be the challenges just on business model to begin with we wanted to roll out everywhere every country etc 
Um, and I think um, our yeah. eyes were too our eyes were too big for our belly, as it were. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. So uh, yeah, I would just to add to that. I think one of the biggest struggles is saying is saying no uh, to things, and and we've we've turned down a lot of things, and and that's that's actually been really useful. And your it, it takes a lot to turn down um, going in certain directions, but at the end of the day, you become a lot more focused and you when when you when you kind of limit your focus and, and restrict yourself in that way you are able to i think build a much better product and really figure out what your usps are and why people are using you and why 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 it's valuable so basically what i'm getting out of this is you had a really broad view and now you're narrowing it down to you know first britain then europe and after that maybe the world but your view before this was the world uh, if I'm getting this correct, right? That's that's a hundred percent correct. Yeah. So we started off everywhere, and we would have probably at that stage, if they were around uh, when we launched, probably tried to do every currency, um, cryptocurrency. Now, we, but then we retracted, and we focused in, understood what was really providing value and what wasn't to our customers understood who our customers were really boring stuff. But this is what makes a business sustainable. And we realized that we should focus and and do really well in an, in in some area, and be a, a big fish in a small pond to begin with. But the plan eventually will be to expand out. But we also realized that we don't need to. As I say, the UK represents over thirty percent of worldwide FX trading volume, so you don't actually need to go ex when you're trading something like a cryptocurrency internationally your to attract business as long as you um from from an international point of view and we we do have international business um as long as you um provide an environment where people can get their money in get their money out have high liquidity in the currency pairs they want and the features which some of us some of you have discussed and alluded to that they want all right um if i may have a follow-up question uh i know you guys have hey. an investor or a funder which is uh, has worked from Goldman Sachs. Did you guys have any issues with that person in particular, like uh, considering few? Sorry, could you could you say that again? Well, you said at the start you said you had funders to you know help you guys uh, sustain, correct? Correct. Uh, do you, do those funders try to push their few up on you, or are your fuse in line with each other? Because, oh, okay. because what I uh, noticed is, uh, is that most of the time funders uh, want to see quick uh, cash, especially when, you know, talking about cryptocurrencies. So, yeah, very good question. So um, the answer is, again, as the company is young, you also you're building a relationship, not just internally, but also you with your major funders. And to begin with, um, we were less sure of our model to be honest and we also had less track records so while our funders had huge track records um now i think over a period of time we we had debates and had discussions um but we have shown that the model that we're taking works and i um it, it is helped by the fact that i think our investors do take a long-term view which may be unusual for um, um, people coming from a background within the city, but they do take that view. Um, and the end result is that they, I think there's a lot of belief in our long-term vision and the fact that we don't have to do everything tomorrow. The end goal is to dominate. And you do that by slow, being slow and steady. All right, thank you. All right, I got a quick question to kind of follow up on the Bitcoin Unlimited uh, SegWit issue. Kind of like, first off, uh, what in your mind would be like the bar or point in which you would consider Bitcoin Unlimited to have taken over the network? And assuming, assuming a split or activation happened that did not meet that metric or bar, how would you respond to that situation? I think we we currently we don't have a position of if X happens, Bitcoin Unlimited will have taken over the network, and we need to um, you know start doing things in in terms of uh, responding to that from a, from a 
coin flow perspective. Um, but at the end of the day, you'll sort of know it when you see it. Um, if if there are two coins and there's a, there's a hard fork, that's that's or 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 there's a hard fork and uh, it's some sort of evil hard fork. Uh, in in I, I say that in terms of uh, the Luke Dash Jr. Um, kind of definition of evil hard fork. You'll you'll know the community will know. So I I wouldn't say we have a, any specific criteria determined. Yeah, at the very least, we, we, we'll probably have to offer some um, service to avoid um, an exploit being performed on our exchange or post hard fork, and we'd have to divert, divert um, development efforts towards protecting our customers' um, balances because they would all automatically have balancings in both accounts. That would hope that doesn't happen because we've seen in Ethereum, um, it's it seems to be a massive time sink um, from from the other exchanges we talk to. But if that happens, we would uh, we would have to support it. We'll be forced to, um, at, at least for the point of view of allowing people to withdraw their to withdraw their Bitcoin in one of those currencies. Okay, thank you. Anyone that has any exchanges, uh, so any questions for uh, spot exchange related trading questions, especially uh, now is your time. Okay, so um, what well, well, there's a, I did see some questions in the chat. Um, well, one of them is stupid. It's about uh, Litecoin, and you already kind of talked about that. So. Um, Okay, well, uh, were, were there any other kind of final thoughts or anything that you uh, wanted to uh, let prospective traders know uh, before uh, before we uh, close it out? Sorry, can you? We, we were trying to read the questions in the um, channel. Can you repeat your question to us? Yes, no, no, none of them were intelligent. There's no reason to uh, to, to use them. Um, so I was just I was just saying that if there was because I, I I don't hear any. There's no um, questions being brought up from anyone else. So I was going to just give you guys another uh, final chance uh, for any anything you wanted prospective traders to know um, who might be interested in uh, in using your exchange. Come and trade on CoinFloor. We've got a uh, we've got great spreads. I mean. At the end of the day, we've got great spreads in GBP, BTC. We've got high liquidity, and uh, anyone is welcome to come and trade volume on Coin4. Um, and my more subdued uh, comment would be, um, you know, we are we're a solid exchange. We're growing consistently. We have listened to the feedback from you guys, and um, we are planning to roll out features over the coming few months, which we hope and believe will will be received very well by the community so please keep um looking at what we're doing um and um you'll hopefully see announcements which are as interesting as the zero fees announcement um that we um and i'll, and I'll take a thought leadership position as well so we always try to do things in a in a, in a slightly more different way from others well, it sounds interesting. We'll keep an eye on things. And um, so Obi and Mark, uh, co-founders at uh, CoinFloor, British uh, Spot Exchange, thanks a lot for uh, spending a bit of time this Saturday discussing uh, this uh, your exchange with, um, with the traders here. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much, guys. Really great to talk to you. Thank you.